Welcome to the show, folks. This is Wrestling Changed My Life. Here we go. And he told me, he says, you know, if you want to be really good, he says, your goal has to be 50 pull-ups, 50 chin-ups, and 200 push-ups uh, each day, and then another 200 push-ups before you go to bed. So 400 push-ups a day, uh, and then 50 pull-ups and 50 chin-ups. I did that every day except competition. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, I spent wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a legend alert today. We got Mark Chirella on the podcast. Mark was a three-time national champ from Michigan in the 70s and a four-time All-American. Today, he's the CEO of the FDI Group. There are so many gems in this conversation, I can't even describe it. So we're just going to get right to it. Before we do, you know what time it is. Fan of the week. This one goes to Coach Andrews from Monarch Wrestling. Greatly appreciate you tuning in, good sir, and looking forward to throwing a few pops back at the national tournament. Last but not least, folks, a couple updates. The first is Gable the Goat Part 2, which is the podcast documentary I've been working on for the better part of three months. That's going live Tuesday, March 17th. If you want an early release of the of the documentary, text Dan Gable, one word, to 555-888. That's Dan Gable, D-A-N-G-A-B-L-E, to 555-888. I will give you an early release version and certainly will welcome any feedback that you have for the, uh, for the documentary. The second update is Big Tens are taking place this weekend in Jersey. And we're doing a happy hour from 3 to 5 p.m. on Saturday at the Brick House Tavern and Tap. It's for podcast listeners, free beer. We're going to be giving away merch, talking wrestling. It's going to be a great time. If you're going to the Big Tens or know someone that is, tell them to come to the Wrestling Changed My Life happy hour this Saturday from 3 to 5 p.m. at the Brick House Tavern and Tap. Okay, that's it, folks. Let's get to the show with one of the great wrestlers of all time, Mark, the Motor City Man, Trella. Peace. My dad started as a shoe salesman and uh, he got into the insurance business in the early 1960s. And he uh, grew an agency really based on his own production, but it was a you know, small business. He had four employees himself as the producer and uh, he always wanted me to go in with him. But uh, I started uh, wrestling and then coaching and then ended up out in Las Vegas and that didn't happen immediately. So from 79 to 1984, I was the assistant for two years and the head coach for three years out there. Came back to Michigan and um, told my dad I would try the, I would try the insurance business for one year, but that was only after, you know, I had interviewed at Brigham Young and thought I was going to get an interview at Notre Dame and at uh, Indiana. And I got turned down by the Mormons, the Catholics, and the Big Ten within a, <laughs> like a 30-day period. What and the so heck? then it was, <clears throat> well, and then it was the thing that uh, everybody has the greatest fear of. Oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to sell insurance. You know, <laughs> and uh, that's a Tom Brady quote, I think. He said that, uh, you know, he says, if I don't get picked up, he says, I'm going to have to go sell insurance. Man, it's... So that's what we did, we, and things have changed over the years. And, uh, you know, wrestling teaches you how to get past adversity. My dad had a heart attack the first uh, 90 days I moved back, and he was out of the business for a year, and, you know, things just changed. And 
we moved on. So uh, he's still around and his health isn't great right now, but uh, he's 88 and we're still a three generation company um, and things are going good. Wow. So your father had a heart attack when you moved back from Vegas back in the 80s? He did. He had a massive heart attack. One of those that they would classify as the widow maker. The only thing that was uh, that worked well for him was he, he had it in the hospital. You know, so it wasn't like uh, one of those things where he went home and he wasn't feeling good. Uh, he thought he pulled a muscle. He was in the office. Um, I told him that it doesn't sound like a pulled muscle. I took him to one of his uh, clients who was a cardiologist. They put him in the hospital for observation over the weekend, and uh, two days later, he had a, a massive cardiac arrest. Holy smokes! So, so that first thing he felt must have been some kind of uh, some kind of early warning sign of it coming. Yeah, it's it's an angina. I mean, it's you know your heart is telling you you're having a heart attack, but your mind's telling you, oh, it's nothing. I, I just heard it this morning <laughs> working out. Pulled muscle. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Well, so, te- technically. Technically, it is a muscle in your body. It just happens to be the most important one. Absolutely. And uh, Mr. Terrell, if it's okay with you, we can just keep rolling into the uh, into the conversation here. Sure. Get going. Cool. Um, so you were talking about how when you left uh, college, you applied for a number of head coaching jobs that ended up at UNLV. What, being the uh, you know the the incredible wrestler that you were, why do you think uh, you didn't get some of those head coaching jobs back in the back in the seventies and eighties? Well, I didn't actually apply for any head jobs to begin with. I applied to, uh, I was looking for a grad assistant job. You know, back in that day, uh, everything had to be, you know, you're an amateur athlete. You couldn't accept any money for wrestling. Uh, But if you were considered a grad assistant, you know, you were at that point allowed to accept money to, uh, to do that. And even though the grad assistant positions and sometimes was truly going to grad school, uh, in my situation, I was looking purely to train for the 1980 games. That's all I was interested in. And I really went to three places. And uh, the first one, actually, we went, my wife, Lefty, and I went to um, three different universities to take a look at where to be. <clears throat> the first one was Oklahoma State. Uh, Tommy Chesbro was the head coach. And as crazy as this may sound, but in 1979, he still didn't have a classified as a full-time assistant coach. Uh, he had some grad assistants, but not a full-time assistant. And he actually was looking at me to be that person and offered me that job. Uh, I flew to Arizona state and I met with Bobby Douglas and he offered me the same position. And then at UNLV, uh, I ended up out there because I was there in 77 to wrestle the junior worlds. I had met the then head coach there, Dennis Fintrock and, you know, good guy. I thought that, uh, maybe that would make sense, but wasn't really sure. And ultimately, I thought I was just going to stay in Michigan and train at the University of Michigan. And then uh, it didn't work out. Um, You know, for some reason, the money wasn't there right away. And I was young and wanted the decision immediately and uh, decided that, uh, you know, Las Vegas seemed interesting for a year and we would move out there. And that one year then turned into five and uh, stayed as the assistant for a couple of years and then three years as the head coach. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought at that point I'd be a career coach. I didn't think that, uh, you know, I was going to really move in any other direction. And in Las Vegas, it allowed me to be not just a, a wrestling coach, but an entrepreneur as well. We got involved in a number of different things in Las Vegas. Started the uh, uh, the collegiate wrestling tournament in Las Vegas, which, you know, this coming year will be the 39th year that we've run it. Um, so I, I kind of liked that environment. Uh, but when they dropped the program, uh, came back to Michigan, and that's probably the best thing that ever happened to uh, – uh, myself, uh, my wife, and, and my family. So you, <clears throat> it's interesting you say it's the best thing ever happened because I was wondering as I was going down the rabbit hole on you, did you did you wish that you would have got into college wrestling and that, uh, coaching from Michigan? I know you coached as an assistant, but did you wish you had stayed in it and coached all the way through? But it sounds like that's not the case. Uh, no, no. For me, um, you know, I, I loved wrestling and uh, as a competitor, uh, I liked working with the kids and, and thought that that was a really great thing. But uh, you know, I think in, in hindsight now, if I had to look at it, probably was always destined to be, you know, uh, more in a business environment than a coaching environment. Um, and uh, that's why I think it worked out really well. And it, it's given me the opportunity to do both. I mean, honestly, uh, I've, um, you know, had never coached at any level except the college level until my son started wrestling. And they didn't start until they were in uh, in middle school, um, so seventh grade. 
Um, and, you know, I started figuring out how you coach younger kids and then coached for several years at the high school while my boys were all going through and then uh, back at Michigan. Yeah, I, I saw that, that you didn't let your kids wrestle until seventh grade. And I thought there's no way that could be true. I mean, because they were so good and how could they get so good just from seventh grade on? So is that something you consciously did or they just weren't interested until middle school? No, that was a conscious thing. I told them that wrestling wasn't an option uh, until they were at least old enough to have tried a number of different sports that weren't wrestling. You know, re- wrestling is the type of sport that, uh, you know, it, it, you have to want to do it. There's no entitlement in wrestling. You know, it's not like because your dad wrestled and he was successful. Oh, that just makes me automatically successful. You've got to do the work. And, you know, that's one thing I learned in wrestling is it's uh Hard work pays big dividends, uh, but you've got to do the work. No one can do it for you. I wanted to make sure that they weren't going to do this just because, you know, their dad did it. And, I, and, and you know, the one school of thought is, is, wow, that was a disservice you did to your sons. They should have wrestled when they were really young. Uh, there's so much technique that they pick up at that point. And, uh, frankly, I'm just not a believer in it. And I know that there's, uh, that's the way it works now. Uh, but uh, I've always felt that, you know, give me a kid that's 12 or 13 years old, uh, and if I coach him, uh, I know that if he's really looking to do the work, he'll he'll make a huge strides in, uh, in in gaining correct technique and being able to be a competitor. And that's really just how we did it. So uh, my expectation was my oldest son, uh, Mark Jr., I thought he'd be a baseball player. He's a really good baseball player. I thought maybe he would play in college. And he had just decided that, uh, you know, he didn't wrestle in high school until he was a junior. Um, and he placed in the top four as a senior and then went to Michigan as a walk-on and uh, was part of the team for four years and <laughs> excuse me, really didn't get uh, to uh, uh, any competition uh, on the varsity level. In some matches he did, but, uh, uh, you know, he just decided to do that. And that was his choice, not mine. Um, and then, uh, my son, Ryan, I always believed Ryan would wrestle because he was kind of like, like me, um, not the greatest athlete, just great competitor. Uh, and then <clears throat> Josh, I figured Josh would play soccer. He was in that Olympic development program. So really, really uh, talented soccer player. And he just told me one day, he says, I'm just wrestling. And, you know, again, my philosophy was, is that if you really want to do it. Um, I'm hundred percent behind you, but you have to want it. Um, so that's, that's kind of how it happened. And, uh, it worked for them. I'm not going to say that it's a, you know, that it's a roadmap for every family that wants to have their kids in wrestling, but, uh, it, it was our, it was our roadmap and, uh, it worked. Now, how, how far apart is Mark jr. Oh. From Ryan <clears throat> in age? <clears throat> Ryan and Mark are three years apart. And then Josh and Ryan are two years apart. Okay. So, <clears throat> excuse me, five years between the oldest and the youngest. So, so by the time your oldest got into it in high school, uh, Ryan was already starting to meddle around with it, and then from there it was kind of off to the races, I'm sure, for you and your you and your family for the next 10, 15 years or so, coaching your boys. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, at, at that point, you know, wrestling, <laughs> wrestling becomes consuming. So, you know, here, here's the, the, my philosophy with, uh, with wrestling – uh, with kids and even when I was a competitor, you know, wrestling is a sport, you know, make sure you understand that, you know, this competition, it's going to come, it's going to go You learn life lessons. And, um, you know, really at the end of the day, it's, it, it, it's not the most important thing in your overall aspect of life. However, when you're doing it, it's the single most important thing in the universe. I mean, there is nothing more important than that because it consumes everything that you have. But again, you got to keep that in perspective. So, you know, that perspective is hard to keep when you're in the mix. So, you know, from uh, a competitor's perspective, it was a lot easier for me, you know, because uh, if you have a loss, you can control how you're going to train and how you're going to handle it and how you're going to overcome the adversity uh, and work harder, work smarter and do all those things. When it's your son's wrestling, it's hard because you don't control any of that. And when they go out to wrestle, uh, that feeling as a competitor that you'd have, and anybody's telling you that, you know, when they get ready to step on the mat, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes there's adversity that, uh, that you're able to overcome. And sometimes you got doubt in your head. And, you know, you shake that guy's hand, you're standing in front of him, it leaves, and you just start competing. 
as a dad, that just doesn't leave. I mean, you're just like standing there watching the whole match and you don't have any impact as to how that's going to go. Uh, but you just have to deal with it. So I, you know, I, I was, again, very, uh, uh, very proud of the fact that they, they did wrestle. And it was more to me um, uh, the, the, the thought that they had to want to do it. Yeah, and it's, I mean, to your point, when you're talking about <laughs> watching your son, I'm only 30 years old, so I, I don't have any kids, but I can only imagine. You don't get that physical release that you did when you were an athlete, you know, either. Yeah, that's exactly right. You get none. <clears throat> you know, all you all you do at the point that you you start this thing is that, uh, you know, you're just really at a point where you believe you've done what you can for them. Uh, they go out there, and then they wrestle it. And then at the end of it, um, you know, you hope for the best outcome. And if it's not there, your job is to encourage them and to tell them, hey, you know, what maybe went wrong in your mind and how you think you can fix it. Um, you know, being a dad coach was uh, an awesome experience for me. And I know there's people that have told me that was the worst experience they ever had. They had such a difficult time coaching their sons. They didn't listen to them. I did not have that experience at all. Yeah, that's. it, it seems like dad <clears throat> coaches who were successful wrestlers, they seem to do – in my opinion, and I've, I've coached before, but do a better job at handling the losses and, and the ups and downs versus a dad coach who wanted to be a good wrestler but never got there, and, and they take everything. <laughs> Every match is, is life and death, and obviously that's not the case. So when your boys were in college and after they lost a tough one, I, I've heard you in interviews say that all your, all your job is is to make sure they're happy and encourage them. But what about when they were younger, when you know middle school, high school, when maybe they took a loss and you weren't happy with the way they performed? Did you ever have to get on them, or is there a situation where a dad coach can, can kind of get on their kids if need be? Yeah, I mean, you got to be a truth teller. Uh, my son Ryan uh, lost in his junior year uh, in a uh, district qualifier, <clears throat> and he just didn't show up that day. I mean, he just wrestled. He wrestled like he was uh, afraid of the guy, and I told him that's just unacceptable. I mean, you have to go out there and you have to compete. You got to believe that you deserve to win. And, you know, that story had a good ending because, you know, he, he went from being majored by the kid to, um, you know, beating the kid and then beating him in the, in the state finals uh, in a really close match. Um, so, you know, sometimes you, you just, you, you have to be the truth teller, but it's tough and you, you got to let them know. And that's the point that you be the coach um, and the dad, but the coach takes uh, precedence at that point. The dad is the one that when they lose the match that, uh, frankly, you know, they did everything they could to win. Uh, you know, then it, that's your role as a dad to, to tell them that, you know, it, it's all right. And you, and you wrestle the best you can. And then to also understand that in their mind, it's not all right. Nobody likes to lose. And wrestling is that sport that, at least for me, the wins stay really, really short. The losses, you know, you remember a long time. <laughs> no question. I mean, I think anyone can remember their losses more than a, more than a big win. <laughs> now, was your father was your father hard on you or encouraging of you? And the, the reason I ask is, looking back at your at your resume, you three time high school state champ. Back in an era where there wasn't a lot of youth wrestling, so to me, it was just amazing to see how much better you were than everybody else. So I was wondering if your dad had a, had a strong hand in your development at a young age. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to correct you with that. I was not a three-time state champion. Okay. I was a one-time state champion. I took in high school when I was a kid was uh, uh, 10 through 12. So it was a three-year high school. Uh, so I, I took third, then second, then first. Okay. And uh, you know, I came up through, um, a program that really was, you know, do it on your own and figure it out. And like a lot of guys of my generation uh, that, you know, were trying to find out how to become better. Everybody knew who Dan Gable was and everybody, you know, heard how he trained and what he did. And frankly, I just figured that part out. I just trained like they said Gable trained and not everybody was doing that at the time. So in, uh, in my situation, my uh, my parents, both my mom and dad, and you know your question to my dad. My dad knew nothing about wrestling, but my dad knew athletics. So my dad was an all-state football player and he was a Golden Gloves boxing champion. Um, and he never he never wanted us to box ever. So he never encouraged it. It wasn't really an option for us. Um, you know, I played football and I wrestled, 
But as far as the wrestling part, all he was was encouragement, 100%. And he is and remains to be probably the most optimistic person and positive person that I've ever met. And he uh, reinforced that with me uh, as an athlete. So he was all encouragement. And there was, uh, you know, there was no, if you will, coach dad, because he didn't know wrestling. I mean, there was nothing that he could contribute except his resources. You know, first is, uh, you know, his commitment to me personally to be involved as an involved father and to take me or be with me anywhere that I needed to be. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the other aspect of it was uh, for him to make sure that I had the resources to, um, to do what I needed to do. So, um, yeah, there was, there was no hard line from my dad about winning and losing. I, I got to tell you, Mr. Torella, I've interviewed you know, over 110 people, and <laughs> almost everyone who has had success in life says that <laughs> same kind of sentiment where the parents, you know, they were never asking them about their single leg technique, and they were never drilling them about wins and losses. They were just there to encourage and, and drive them to where they needed to be, and, and that was pretty much it. Yeah, well, you know, my, my dad's involvement during the match, uh, my, you know, this is back before video. This is Super 8 film. My dad filmed every match I ever wrestled. I'm talking about, you know, not every, but I'm talking 95 to 98% of every match I ever wrestled is on 8 millimeter film. Wow. And, uh, you know, th th it's been transferred to, to video at, at, at this point. But I have, you know, which most kids never had at that time was if I did lose to somebody, I actually had film and I could watch film and I could see what the heck happened. Um, and, you know, I, I really thought that that was an advantage at the time is to be able to look at it. Um, by the time I got into um, my senior year in high school, I did not look at any match unless I lost. So my, my senior year, I never looked at a film because I didn't lose. Uh, and, but any loss, I was really interested in how I lost. Um, more so than how I won. I kind of figured that the winning part was was good. Need to figure out what happened in the loss and try to overcome that. Man, that is that's pretty mature for a young guy to think that way. And obviously, it speaks to the success you had later in life. But I, I want to go back to one thing you said um, about the optimism that your father has. I think that's probably one of the most important traits any person can have. Um, is that something that, that you've picked up and carried with you through business and try to pass on to your kids as well, just generally being optimistic and from there the rest will take care of itself? Oh, there's no question about that. You have to you have to believe. And I mean you have to believe in yourself, you gotta believe in the team that you're assembling, uh, and you have to be positive. Uh, you know, there's so much negativity. It's easy to go down the rabbit hole that says that, hey, listen, I'm not going to uh, be able to achieve it's not going to work well for me today. There's, you know, th there's always going to be a problem. I understand that. But how you're going to solve it and how you embrace it uh, and enjoy the whole thought that you're going to be able to solve a problem as opposed to the woe is me. I can't get past it. Um, yeah, so I, I think positivity, being, uh, being objective uh, and being a realist, you know, sometimes if you say it's not going to work good, then move on to something else put that one away and, and start getting into something that's going to be positive and, and move your life forward. But yeah, I mean, that's a big part of, uh, of how I was raised in my, my personal background, but that's certainly how I've applied it to uh, when I was a competitor, a coach and in business. Well, and I think back to, uh, you know, a couple of matches you had in college, your senior year, you were a two time national champ going into the big tens was the match with Deanna at big tens, your senior year. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, it was my senior year. So you, you lose to him at the Big Tens, but then you ended up hitting him at the Nationals. So those two weeks in between, was there was there self-doubt kind of fluttering through your mind, or, or where were you at mentally kind of getting ready for that match going into the Nationals? Yeah, I didn't have self-doubt there. I mean, I wrestled, Mike was a great competitor, you know, and, and a, a really great wrestler. Um I wrestled him twice that year before the Big Ten and beat him both times pretty well. Uh, in the Big Ten, he wrestled phenomenal, and I didn't wrestle great. Uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it was one of those matches where there was a lot of points scored, and it was the old-school overtime. You know, so that was an eight-minute match and a three-minute overtime. And I, I can't tell you what the score was, but it was it, there weren't just like two or three points scored. 
it was like a lot of points. Maybe the score was uh, 13 up by, by the time we were in the overtime, uh, or maybe it's what it was when we finished. So there was a lot going on. Um, so yeah, you know, did I have after that match after the loss? Oh, I mean, I, I can still remember getting back to Ann Arbor and the newspaper in town, the Ann Arbor News, um, was not, uh, you know, a, a big supporter of wrestling. At least they, they never really covered it. And somehow I made the front page of the Ann Arbor News that I lost. <laughs> and I was like, are you serious? I cut the article out and I stuck it on my wall in the bedroom. And I went, that's not happening again. And, uh, you know, I just really, really got into the, to, to the groove of, um, you just keep working as hard as you can and you just get out there and you compete. Um, you know, so in the era of, uh, you know, no majors or uh, tech falls, you just either won or lost or pinned a guy, you know, in the national tournament, sometimes you had to go eight minutes and you could score 20 points in a match and you still had to wrestle. Um, so, so, you know, by the time you get to uh, the finals, um, you know, you really have to put it in perspective. And that is, this is my opportunity to do what I've been training for um, and go out there and, and make it happen. And, you know, that's what I planned on doing is competing. And what was the training like back then compared to what you did with your boys when you were the assistant at Michigan or what Coach Borme is doing now? I mean, I'm guessing a lot more road work, a lot more pumping iron, but – just uh, give us some insight into that. When you were a college athlete, what what a training regiment was like throughout the season compared to now. Yeah, we, the, the, to me, the vast difference between then and now uh, is just how much smarter the whole, the whole training is and what they know that we didn't know. So, you know, the idea to just like work yourself to death, never really take an active rest day. It was all about grinding it as hard as you could it was not the smartest way to train. So I, I would say, you know, there's, there's marked differences. Uh, first is, is, you know, weight control as opposed to cutting weight. You know, yeah, you know, they, they control the weight. They got to weigh in an hour before I was in the era that we weighed in the night before, at least, you know, uh, three years of my college experience was the night before weigh in. And you had just massive weight cutting that was going on. Uh, the other thing is nutrition. Didn't under, did not understand nutrition back then. Um, and now they have a, just a, a highly sophisticated understanding of what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat, uh, you know, and, and how really to, um, uh, to take care of your body. So I, I think that the, the whole training plan that they come up with is different than what we had. You know, my attitude was, is that you work as hard as you can all the time and you just keep going. And, you know, today they work very hard, but they work extremely smart. And, you know, I think what's done at the University of Michigan today and probably most universities across the country is they have training plans. They have individual workouts for the athletes and, and try to design things around the athlete more so than just everybody needs to do the same thing all the time. Um, you know, so with me, uh, you know, there, there wasn't a high sophistication of um, strength training. You know, the, the strongest person that I believe ever wrestled pound for pound was Mark Johnson. Yes. <laughs> uh, that, that guy was unbelievable in college. Um, and he was he was what I classify as scary strong. You know, uh, he was a couple of weight classes ahead of me, two or three weight classes ahead. And, you know, if I wrestled with him, it just was not a good experience uh, mentally because I always felt like something could get hurt. Um, and because he was just that powerful. He had that much intimidation. Uh, you know, for, like he was like, that's how big he was. Yeah. He's a strong guy. Wow. You know, wow. and, and he hit the weights. He hit the weights like people did not do at that time. He was kind of a hybrid, uh, really, really mentally tough, physically tough wrestler that looked like a bodybuilder. Cause you know, he was a big Arnold fan back when Arnold wasn't the, you know, the, the popular guy, you know, he was just kind of coming up with this whole Mr. Universe or whatever it was. And, you know, Mark, Mark had the physique of a bodybuilder uh, and the uh, aptitude of a wrestler. And he also had the strength that went along with it. You know, for me, you know, mine was just like a whole different workout uh, regime. I never lifted weights in college ever. Um, my high school coach started me on this plan and asked me, oh, how many pull-ups can you do and how many chin-ups and how many push-ups? And so I said to him, I don't know. So we, you know, we tried. And, you know, the first time I did like 15 pull-ups and, 
16 or 17 chin ups and uh, in one set. And then uh, I could do like 60, 70 push ups. And he told me, he says, you know, if you want to be really good, he says, your goal has to be 50 pull ups, 50 chin ups, and 200 push ups uh, each day. And then another 200 push ups before you go to bed. So 400 push ups a day, uh, and then 50 pull ups and 50 chin ups. I did that every day except competition. That's what I worked into by the end of my sophomore year. And I just did it every single day. I would do, if I wasn't competing, I'd do 50 pull-ups in one set, 50 chin-ups, a set of 200 push-ups, and then 200 push-ups before I went to bed. That was my day. Wow. And that was my, phys- that was my physical workout. And, you know, it was, it was kind of a mental thing, too. Uh, 50 pull-ups, a lot of pull-ups. At least it's it was lot. for me. It's a lot. <laughs> no, it's and, a lot. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and chin-ups, too. And, uh, and doing two sets of 200 push-ups, it is a mm-hmm. mindset. And it's, it's, you know, it's a physical thing, but it's a mindset, too. So, you know, my training was with that. Um, that was my strength training. And as far as uh, conditioning, I ran three, four miles all the time, like every day. And that's kind of, you know, that's not very sophisticated, but it's what I did. And how many days do you think you missed that pull-up, uh, push-up regime over your high school career? Uh, unless I had a competition day, I Exc- didn't miss one. Excluding the competition days, yeah. But you're saying – if you didn't have a competition, you literally never missed throughout your career. Right. Wow. I love stories like that. And it's like, yeah, I didn't, did you I know, did not do it. Did you know you were unique for doing that and that you had this kind of fire inside you that most people don't have, or you just thought everyone did that? I didn't know if anybody did it besides me. I just knew I was doing it. I, I, I believe that um, when I went out to wrestle somebody that nobody worked harder than I did. The guy that I was wrestling did not work harder than me. And then to rationalize it, I would always say to myself, you know, if, if I'm wrestling a guy from the University of Iowa, I would say, if I went to Iowa, do you think that I would be starting or that guy would be starting? And I always said, oh, I'd be the starter. There's no way he can beat me. And that, that rationalization in my head is really how I viewed it. You know, so uh, it didn't matter if I was wrestling someone from Iowa or from Murphy State, or from, you know, University of Oklahoma at the time that were all really, really solid programs. That's kind of how I viewed it. And that rationalization said, you know, I, I believe I worked harder. I believe I earned the, uh, should, should be uh, able to earn the win. And if I wrestled at theory school, like I wouldn't be starting. So, you I know, mind that. games to myself, but yeah. it just, um, it worked. I love hearing uh, the inner dialogue with people and Listeners of this show are blue in the face of hearing me ask about self-talk and things like that. So, so I won't because you just hit on it. But you know, the the inner dialogue people have with themselves is so fascinating to me. And so, when yeah, you... I mean, I, 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 <laughs> here's what, here's what I'll tell you. You know, the, the 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 part about the inner dialogue. Anybody who tells you that you know uh, they never have any self-doubt, I don't believe them. I just believe that the really, really great ones overcome it quickly. You know, they, they have something that triggers it. Um, you know, so if they say, I never, ever have self-doubt, I'm going to say, man, that just doesn't make any sense to me. The question I have for you is how quickly do you overcome it? How much can you suppress it? Uh, you know, uh, what effect does it have on you? Um, can you find motivation within it? You know, th- those are the things. And so that's what you would tell your son if they, if you maybe sense that they had some self doubt going into a match, um, you would kind of talk them through that process there. Yeah, the best I could. But you know, something at the end of the day, they have to believe. Not just me. I mean, I believe you have the ability to win it. The question you have to ask yourself is, do you believe it? You know, that's the part of the entitlement. You know, you don't have any entitlement. It's not just because I believe it's going to happen for you. I believe I can motivate. I believe that uh, you've done everything you possibly can. But I also know I can't wrestle the match for you. God, that's what's great about wrestling, though. It's like wrestling doesn't care who your dad is, who your uncle is, what you you know, what your relations are. It's all up to you. And I mean, I think that's why we all love it so much. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's it's that sport, you know, the one that allows all that to happen. Yeah, I mean, it's an incredible sport like that. Now, a couple of things related to um, post post college career. Um, you know, you mentioned that when you were in Vegas, you started to get the entrepreneur bug a little bit, 
and and you said you started the Cliff Keen tournament, and and then you took over your dad's company. What was the state of financial designs when you took it over back in the '80s versus what it is now? Because from the outset, it looks like it's grown tremendously over the years. Yeah, it's a it's a different structure. I mean, the the, the structure that uh, my dad had was really based on his his sales ability and his production. And uh, you know, today from that company that was him and four other people, we're a, still a small enterprise. But we have 170 people over you know, a corporate platform that has, um, you know, eight active companies that are doing a number of things in the insurance space. So, you know, realistically, yeah, it's a completely different company or group of companies than he had. He had one and we have others that specialize in, uh, in a number of different areas of the industry. So uh, from that perspective, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very different than what it started with. Um, but, you know, it was that platform. And, and frankly, from the time that I got into business to today, um, you know, he's, uh, his position was, uh, after he came back from his heart attack, that I do a better job operating than he did. And he was a better salesperson. So, uh, we had a plan at that point that he would just sell me the company. He just continued to, to do what he did best. And that's really what happened. Man, I'm in sales myself. So I love, I love hearing any sales related stories and obviously insurance, it comes down to sales, uh, at the, at the front lines level, um, did you have any habits or routines that you did over the years in business that you thought was separating you from, from your competitors, such as what you did with the push-up and pull-up routine back when you were a wrestler? Yeah, I mean, anybody that goes into business figures out that, uh, I mean, in, unless you're just like a really lucky person. And, you know, I, I was told many years ago, the harder you work, the luckier you get. But sometimes things just happen for you. I wasn't that person. So I always knew that, uh, you know, the first two years that I was really in business, I was coaching too. So I was on staff at Michigan that 84, 85 and 85, 86 season. Uh, so my day started very early uh, and they finished late and they finished with a wrestling practice. Uh, and that was, you know, after doing everything that I could inside the business and then doing the other. Uh, and, and for me, you know, my, my competitive career uh, after college, I only lasted about a year. And that's because, you know, my wife, Leslie and I had been together for a very long time. So we met when we were very young kids at 12, dated at 16, got married at 20 when I was still in school. And uh, right in, you know, 79, she was pregnant with our first who was born in 1980. Uh, I needed to get a job. You know? <laughs> so, uh, and, and, you know, that job wasn't going to be chasing, you know, the, uh, uh, an opportunity to wrestle, uh, in the Olympics in 84, they boycotted in 80. Uh, I had decided that's it, you know, and I'm just going to move on from there. Uh, you know, in today's environment, you would, you could say, geez, you, you can keep going for a while. I mean, cause you can actually make a, uh, a living to support yourself. You couldn't make a living to support yourself. If you were going to compete, it was extremely difficult to do that and stay, you know, several Olympic cycles. Yeah, the it seems like when you when you talk to guys from that era, yourself, the Lee Kemp's, like there was truly no money. I mean, they they talk about not having money, you know, after after Foxcatcher collapsed and all that, but we're talking about a whole another level of <laughs> you can't take any money. I mean, because the the IOC was so strict at that time. I mean, it's night and day difference compared uh, now oh, for, the, for the athletes. Yeah, no comparison. Yeah, you you would do a camp. And you had this paranoia that, you know, you had to be paid in cash, you know, because there can't be any record that you receive compensation for doing a clinic. I mean, as, as crazy as that sounds, that's, that's how it was, you know, that uh, at least for me, I was just so concerned that you're going to go through all of this to then find out that, uh, hey, you're, you're not eligible. You've been declared a professional athlete. And, you know, imagine being declared a professional athlete earning 75 bucks. You know, that, um, but you know, that was a different time and it's evolved and things are different now. And, 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 and that's good. You know, that, uh, that people can uh, chase their passion for an extended period of time. Cause I mean, realistically, when you, if you really think about it, you got a short window, you get to do this. You know, it's, um, there's not a lot of guys between the ages of 30 and 40 that are world-class competitors it's the, you know, 
less than 1% of people that can really do that. Um, and a lot of these guys are really, really tough athletes, you know, between the ages of 22 and 30. That's, you know, really a, a prime time for a wrestler. Even though I know there are some guys that are older that are still competing at that, uh, that world level, but there's not a ton of them underneath them. So, you know, for every guy that's 32 that's competing, he's got a bunch of guys that are 22 to 25 trying to take his spot. Absolutely. And you look at someone like Chris Campbell who did, who made a comeback like he did, it makes it even more impressive back in that era. Yeah, but, you know, the, how many Chris Campbells are there? Chris Campbell is, uh, you know, he, he is the exception to just about everything. <laughs> I mean, you know, in, 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 in my generation, I looked at Chris Campbell and thought, man, the guy could just score whenever he needed to. And nobody could score on him. That was a, you know, that was a great athletic gift that he put to full use. And, uh, you know, very impressive that, uh, that he was able to do that. But there weren't like seven Chris Campbells behind him trying to take his spot. Right. There were seven young guys behind him trying to take that spot. <laughs> but not, there's only one Chris Campbell. So in a generation, there's a handful, and that's it. Yeah, I mean it's and and for the and for the vast majority of wrestlers, it ends after high school, and so it's really a small window. And then obviously there's there's a select group that go into wrestling in college. So most people that wrestled never went past high school. So it is an extremely small window, especially when you get a little bit older in life and you start looking back at how much how little you knew back then and <laughs> how uh, how small of a window that is of your life. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you really think about it and you, and you look, you have um, you have an opportunity to start wrestling today at five years old or six years old. You know, how many six years old six year olds make the transition to the next level, and that next level, which might be you know close to uh, middle school, makes that transition to high school. And how many of the athletes make the transition from high school to college? And the ones that are very successful in college how many of them really have the opportunity to compete for those handful of spots to make a world or Olympic team? It's a very, very small number as it goes up. And, and, and unlike a sport like football where you have professional football and yes, there's a, it, it's still a very small number that gets there, but the opportunities are broader. You know, you, you have so many different uh, opportunities yeah, I heard this, and maybe it's not a great analogy, but the analogy uh, I heard is that, you know, in the 1960s and the 1970s, it was a huge deal to be a TV star because they had three network stations. That's it. Hmm. You know, and so it was a big deal. Today, how many channels can you turn to? How much content is there? It's, there's just a ton. So there's far more opportunities for someone to be a working actor. To be a wrestler and to make an Olympic team, there's still the same spots there were in the 1960s. Actually, there's fewer. Fewer. Fewer opportunities yeah, it's, to wrestle in college and fewer uh, opportunities to make the world team. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's a narrower path you have to walk down. So the competition is just that much greater. Yeah. And, 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 and unfortunately, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that lose an opportunity because of that. But it's just it's reality. It's what's happened. Yeah, I mean, and you talk about losing opportunities. What happened in 1980 is, is one of the most unfortunate things, um, you know, wrestling has had. The Team USA has happened because you had Mark Johnson, you had, you know, all these all these studs who, who weren't able to compete. And I'm, he I'm hearing, and not to be negative, but I'm hearing that the coronavirus may impact things. So let's hope to God that doesn't happen because, man, that would be just a shame to see another Olympics gone to the wayside like that. Um I mean, back when you guys were in 80, did you know at the Olympic trials that you weren't going or was it after the Olympic trials that the Olympics were canceled for the U.S.? Uh, they knew before the Olympic trials. So I went to – at that time, you know, they had two different things. They had the AAU and the U.S. Uh, United States Wrestling Federation. <clears throat> and I was kind of in between weights at the time. And I competed in the Federation Nationals and lost in the finals, which was actually my last match I ever wrestled. Lost in the finals to Mark Lieberman from Lehigh. Uh, and then when I found out that there's, you know, there's not going to be uh, a U.S. Uh, participation in the Olympics and the members of the Olympic team, their uh, reward was going to be a visit to the White House to see President Carter. I was like, man, I'm going to go get a job. That, <laughs> does not, that does not motivate me at all to be able to say I was on the Olympic team. Uh, you know, it's a great honor. And I think that the guys that did that, 
was an awesome thing. But I think most of the guys that did that, uh, the highest percentage, said I'm staying till 84. When I knew I'm not staying till 84. And so, you know, making a commitment to me to that, on the, on that next Olympic cycle, I just wasn't going to do it. You know, I, I always told my wife, I said, you know, I know that this whole wrestling thing that I do is got to be the most selfish portion of my life uh, because it's all about yourself. How do you feel? What are you going to eat? How much, you, you know, what do you weigh? I mean, whoever asks you what's your weigh nowadays it, to me, <laughs> but then it was like a big deal. How many are you over? You know, your coach always wants to know how, how, how is it going for you? Um, and I told her, I said, after I'm done, once I decide I'm done, I'm never going to come back and do this again as a competitor. And I'll never, you know, be selfish in that regard ever again in my life. And that's, you know, that was the, the difference. I made that decision. And once I did it, I had committed to it. And I was not going to, not going to go back. Now, my, my great friend and teammate, uh, Steve Frazier, in 1984, uh, you know, he stayed that cycle from 80 to 84. Uh, you know, Steve, Mark Johnson, and I were all teammates. Uh, Mark stayed in that cycle. Mark was supposed to be the guy in 84, and Steve beat him. And then Steve ended up winning the gold medal. That happens. And, you know, it's, uh, heart, it was heartbreaking to, to watch that happen to Mark, and it was exhilarating to see Steve have that success. You know, that's the, you know, the odd part of, uh, of wrestling. That just happens sometimes. So, um, you know, for me, it was my, it was the right decision for me, for others, you know, I could see why they would stay in, um, and continue to compete. Yeah. It's like, I didn't realize that Mark had gone again in 84. Um, I'm a huge fan of Mark Johnson and, uh, yeah, that's, that's, it's kind of interesting to look back in and play it out like that. Um, uh, well, Mr. Trell, I know we. We're kind of running short on time here. I have, I did want to ask you about a couple, uh, a couple legendary figures from your time where I think a lot of people now maybe don't know the names, but they were incredibly impactful back then. Um, the first one is Bill Wick. He was a, you know, a legendary Chicago coach, and uh, you know he coached the '72 Olympic team. Did you ever have any encounters with Bill Wick? And if so, what do you remember from those, uh, those meetings? <laughs> Bill Wick was uh, something else. All right. So Bill Wick was the uh, coach of the 1977 junior world team, which I was on and uh, never had met Bill Wick before. And, you know, he had these mannerisms where he was like constantly sweating and rubbing his face and wiping <laughs> his face. And, you know, he, he had a, a cadence to his speak, you know, the way that he spoke and, and how that worked. And he was just definitely a character. Um, I met him the first time. At I, um, uh, there was a training camp was at Central Michigan University. It moved from there to Murfreesboro, Tennessee after that, and then to Las Vegas. And I had been at the Central Michigan camp a week before he even showed up. I went home, and in 77, I had, uh, was engaged but wasn't married yet and uh, went home to be with Leslie, came back. And uh, I went in to meet him, and he said to me, uh, you owe me six miles. And I looked at him, and I was like, what's this guy talking about? He said, we had a run this morning. You weren't here. I said, well, coach, I'd been to camp the whole week before. No one was even here. He said, it doesn't matter. You owe me six miles. He says, I expect you to have them done by tomorrow. Well, what he didn't tell me was is that there was six miles the next day that had to be done, too. I ran 12 miles that day. Oh, my. I mean, he, he, he was crazy. But, uh, but I will say crazy like a fox. He had us in the best possible shape. And, you know, he, he just was uh, – he was an American original, Bill Wick. Uh, you know, he was motivational. Uh, he was, um, I don't even know how to classify him other than, you know, he made a difference in my life. And without Bill Wick, I don't know that I was going to uh, win a junior world championship or win it as well as I did. I just felt like I was like a machine after training with that guy. Wow. But, you know, he did this, he did this thing that you had to get up every morning at like five o'clock or five thirty, and you had to run two miles before breakfast. And then you went in and you had this deal where you had to, uh, to do uh, your, your, your practice. Then in the afternoon, like in the mid sun, he had these stakes set up every hundred yards and he made you do a walk jog sprint for four miles. You walked for hundred, maybe it was 50. Then you jog, then you sprinted and he watched everybody do that. And you had to finish that whole circuit. Then you wrestled in the afternoon 
then he had to run two miles before bed. Oh and that was his plan. God. And we did that every day. No um, recovery day. <laughs> no. He was, the guy was crazy. Oh, man. I, I ended up with tendonitis in my knee in Tennessee and went and got shot up uh, with a, a cortisone shot to get the swelling out. And he was asking me, he says, well, when are you going to get your run in today? I told him, I said, I'm not. You know, at that point, you just have to be a little smart. But he uh, he was uh, the, the guy that, you know, that maybe in the Chicago area that he was uh, he was known. Outside of that, other than, you know, with uh, of my generation, elite, elite athletes knew him. Some thought he was just crazy. And some thought he was, you know, like me, crazy like a fox. He was uh, uh, he, he was an interesting character. So, uh, and interestingly enough, I found an old video. Um, actually, it was, I think, a 16 millimeter film that was put on video. Bill Wick against Mike Rodriguez, who um, coached at Detroit Catholic Central for 40 some years and went to the University of Michigan. Bill Wick at Iowa State Teachers College, which is now Northern Iowa, wrestling in the national finals. And there was not a lot of technique executed in that match. <laughs> uh, a lot of standing up straight and pushing around and not much else going on. <laughs> but wow. you know, the, the, the different era but yeah, yeah uh g- great respect for bill wick and uh you know debt of gratitude uh to him uh helping me out during that time in 77 that's awesome and i've heard that he was also kind of a a master with the with the mentality as well and maybe that was just through the physical work you guys were doing that that kind of complemented itself or if he had s- s- time set aside to to work on the the mental game the visualization and so forth yeah, he he was uh, you know he, he worked best with some uh, some personalities and not as well as others. He he worked good with my personality, but you know that that team that I was on, um, number of different guys, but uh, uh, Randy Lewis was on that team, Andre Metzger, Dan Severn, uh, Jeff Blatnick. There were a lot of guys that uh, had great success after, you know that that whole thing. Uh, 100, 500. Bobby Weaver was on that team. Um, you know, it wasn't like they had a lack of talent there. And, you know, the, the one thing, and Bill Wick was just so adamant about certain things. Um, you know, Dave Schultz was supposed to be on that team, but he wouldn't let Dave try out because Dave wasn't there in time. And I was like, oh, man, I, it, it cost a team championship. We would have definitely, at that point, won a team championship, but we didn't. You kind of respect that, uh, that those old school kind of guys where it's it's black and white, man. If you're not there, you're not there. But obviously, there's 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 wiggle room in some situations, especially when we're talking about Dave Schultz. Um, the other guy I wanted to ask you about, just being a Michigan man, Cliff Keen. Now, I don't know if he coached you in college or if he was already done by that time. I know nothing about the man other than he makes some great. You know, the company makes awesome gear, but. What do you remember uh, about Cliff Keen, and why do you think his name is still uh, still persisting through the wrestling world all these years later? You know, Cliff Keen is one of the iconic figures that you'd have to just do a little bit of uh, background and history on Coach Keen and say to yourself, holy smokes, I can't believe the guy lived a life like that. You know, through the generations that he came up, you know, from being in Oklahoma, a Native American, uh, you know, coming to the University of Michigan, uh, there used to be, and they don't have these same photos anymore, the team pictures. Um, so uh, I would look at him at practice. Now, Coach Keene was not my coach. Uh, he had retired, uh, I think, in 69 or 70, co- coached for 45 years, I believe, oh my at the God. university. And you would see the team pictures from when he was a young man wrestlers didn't have shirts on they just had tights on and he's standing there in the picture and you watched him age as all these pictures just from one end of the room to the other end of the room and then the big picture that they had of him up there with his whistle on his coaching jacket and kneeling on one knee uh you know coach keen was one of those iconic figures that if you ever had the privilege to meet him and to talk with him he had this amazing memory that he could tell you about all the different people, you know, young men that wrestled for him and what they do today and how, you know, how, how they become successful. It didn't matter, you know, whether they were a teacher or, you know, a uh, industry icon, he just knew all that. And I was really fortunate to be able to have spent time with him at different opportunities. The last time and the most poignant, poignant time was Cliff had these very large, 
maybe two feet by, you know, a foot and a half sized scrapbooks that had the history of all the different matches, newspaper articles, things were put together and talk me through that. And I remember driving him home and spending a couple hours in his house with him and him telling just all these stories about different things. Uh, you know, Cliff coached football at Michigan with, you know, some of the iconic coaches that were there. Mm -hmm. uh, they used to have freshman football or lightweight football, smaller guys that played. Uh, he coached uh, at the different levels of, of football. Uh, one of his guys that he coached was President Jerry Ford. And, you know, as his son Jim used to tell me, when President Ford ever came in town, uh, he always would uh, communicate with Coach Keene. Uh, you know, uh, he was a, uh, uh, he served in World War II. Uh, you know, the guys he served with, the iconic names he used to bring up, it was just like, man, you know, this guy is like a movie. You know, just the, the stuff that uh, that occurred in his life. And, you know, what a lot of people don't know is, yeah, he was a wrestling coach. He had a law degree. Uh, he went to law school. He practiced a little bit, but his passion was really coaching wrestling and wrestlers. Uh, and that's where he stayed the course. And he was the one that believed that, uh, you know, you shouldn't end up with a college flower ear just because you wrestled. And he invented the headgear. Uh, and that's really where Cliff Keen Athletics started. Really? That's where it all you know, started? And, uh, that's where it started. You know, was that he just didn't think you should end up with a cauliflower ear just because you decided to wrestle. And, you know, he developed the first wrestling headgear. Uh, the NC2A then decided, well, this should be something that, uh, that kids wear, and they made it mandatory. And that was the start of the business. And they've evolved and become, you know, a really great wrestling equipment company. And I know they produce other things as well. And it's being run by, uh, you know, third generation, uh, Cliff's grandson and Jim's uh, son, Tom Keene. Uh, so it's still a family-owned company. Man, that's a guy who lived a life. You know, like the, the experiences he had, man, to be able to talk to him must have been a real, real honor. Yeah, it's, uh, and he used to come in the wrestling room, and uh, there was uh, a guy that uh, he coached, but then also taught uh, or uh, coached with, but uh, was one of his wrestlers at one time. Uh, his name was Dr. Donahue, and Dr. Donahue used to come in with Cliff, and they always wanted to show you something. And, you know, it was, it was funny in some uh, regards because of the stuff they were showing you is illegal. You couldn't even do it anymore. <laughs> you know, these like diff different submission locks and that. And I said, yeah, it's really good. I said, you know, coach, you can't do that anymore. And he'd look at me and it's like, you know, they've softened the sport. I said, well, you know, that, that's an old school guy's approach. I mean, I think it, uh, at some point I've got, uh, uh, you know, things that, and moves that I executed that I wonder today at what point they'd have called them potentially dangerous. Right, right. Whereas... Yeah, but you know, but, uh, but Coach, Coach Keen was the type of individual that uh, just represented such a long period of time of Michigan wrestling history, uh, and will always be an iconic figure there. Always, um, so cool to hear a little bit of background on him. I I know we could probably spend just hours alone on on his uh, impact of the sport, but I know you don't have that. So, Coach, we'll ask you, <laughs> Coach, sorry, Mr. Trell, we'll ask you one more question, then we'll sign off here, sir. And we ask everyone this. And you've hit on it briefly throughout the, the podcast, but, you know, the name of the show is Wrestling Changed My Life. And how would you say that wrestling's had the biggest impact on you or in what, what ways has the sport impacted your life? Uh, it, it, it shaped the way I view and look at things and how I work. Um, you know, it, it taught me how to, uh, you know, take humility from a loss and turn it into a win and accept that and become humble. Uh, it taught me, like I said, that, you know, hard work pays dividends and that, uh, you know, you have to do the work. No one's going to do it for you. Um, so you get up every morning and you can't count on the fact that someone else is going to do it. You need to do it. Uh, you know, wrestling changed my life in regards to learning how to commit to something and really, really uh, not let go of it. Uh, you know, you have to have a great desire, a degree of desire, and uh, it allows you to demonstrate whether you have courage or not. You know, uh, and I think that wrestling has, has done that. Um, you know, I, I think that if you take, really take a look at, uh, you know, what it's offered me, uh, it's taught me how to persevere. Uh, it's taught me how to be persistent. And it's, um, 
given me a, a responsibility to pass it along. And so um, I think it, uh, if wrestling has done anything, it's um, given me a better life. Well said, Mr. Trella. It's been a real honor to talk with you, sir. Was looking forward to this one all week, and hopefully we'll be able to, to say hello, hello to each other at the Nationals. Sounds good, Ryan. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for listening to Wrestling Changed My Life and spending the better part of the last hour with us. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the show and whatever app you listen on and leave a rating. Also, if you want updates from the show, text WRESTLE, W-R-E-S-T-L-E, to 555-888. That's WRESTLE to 555-888. That's it, folks. Have a great day. 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 That's it, folks.